Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn, and we are so glad that you're joining us today for 3ABN Sabbath School panel because we do this for you, and we have fun doing it, don't we? Yes, we enjoy studying the Word of God. Today we're on Lesson 8, Planning for Success, but let me introduce the panel to you, to who I have here, Ryan Day. <laughs> Amen. I've got Monday's lesson entitled, The Blessing of Work, Ideally. I, I didn't. Amen. And John Dinsey. Thank you. I, it's a blessing for me as well to be here. And I have Tuesday, the earning years. Mm. Uh, that's good. My sister in Christ, Jill Morricone. Thank you, Shelley. I have Wednesday, working with integrity. Amen. And finally, my pastor, John Lomacain. I'm way down here at the end. I have seeking godly counsel, mm. a powerful uh, lesson. That is, it's all... What I love about this particular quarter, it's very practical. Yes. It's, yeah. it's getting us right at that place where we need counsel the most. And John Dinsey, would you please have our opening prayer? Sure. Let us pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, blessed be your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be used by you. We ask that you will bless us with your Holy Spirit. Let us not speak our words, but your words. We pray, Lord, for a blessing upon each and every person that will join us wherever they may be in this world. We pray that your word will not return unto you void, that it will bring fruit yeah. that will bring you honor and glory. Thank you for 3ABN and what you are doing every day through this ministry of divine origin. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We pray for these things in the holy and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah. We always love, we believe that the Holy Spirit is the teacher. We're just being a mouthpiece here. If you have your Bible, please open to Colossians 3, 23, and we are going to read together our memory text. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. It says, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. That's what he has stored up in heaven for us. For you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want to live a happy, successful life? You know, in our fallen world, sometimes that's hard to achieve, but it depends upon what your definition of success is. We can look at Joseph in Egypt, and he went from a a pit to a prison to a palace and say he was successful. Or we can look at John the Baptist who went from preaching and making the way for the Jesus Christ to being in imprisoned and then beheaded. But yet he was a success. So it depends on how we define success. But this week, what we're going to do is look at the idea of success in the context of basic stewardship and financial principles. So what we're going to do is look at these practical steps that won't guarantee success, but I do guarantee if you follow them, you're going to be better off mm -hmm. than if you did not. So Sunday's lesson is first things first. Ecclesiastes 12, 1, Solomon writes, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Mm -hmm. I talk to a lot of seniors who say, this whole idea of the golden years is a joke. Sometimes as you're growing older, you're in pain, you're going through difficult times, and we need to remember to look to the Lord when we're young. As youth begin to mature, they take on responsibilities and basic necessities of life, food and clothing and shelter, and there's so many things that can compete mm -hmm. with our attention and distract us from serving the Lord, so we need to learn how to prioritize. First things first, Jesus tells us what to do. In Matthew 6, 33, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and all these other things will be added unto you. When you enter into a covenant relationship with the Lord, when you're seeking His righteousness, which He gives us by faith, but then we also continue to develop, it is something to see how God provides for His children, I'll tell you. Isaiah says this. I, I'm going to tell you, I pursue righteousness. That is something every morning I say, create in me a clean heart, cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Oh Lord, cause me to hunger and thirst for your righteousness. And people say, well, why? Here's my, one of my favorite promises about righteousness. Isaiah 32, 17 says, the work of righteousness will be peace. Yes. When you are in right standing with God and you in right doing with God, you can count on God's peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Mm -hmm. You can count on God to satisfy your needs. Amen. But I always like to show people that being made righteous by faith doesn't mean that we don't walk in obedience because the goal of righteousness by faith is that we become like Jesus. Romans 6, 16, Paul says this, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? We're all a slave to one power or the other. He says, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness. Mm -hmm. God expects His children to walk in loyalty to Him and in love that motivates obedience. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. So what we're going to look at in this lesson is the story of Jacob in Genesis 28. So let me set this up. We know that Jacob's mother was told by God the younger would serve the older of the two twins that were in her belly. So she devises this scheme and Jacob participated in it. Jacob means deceiver. And she tricks her husband, Isaac, into giving the clan blessing, the firstborn clan blessing that actually Esau had sold for a bowl of lentils. But she disguises her son, Jacob, and Isaac gives the firstborn clan blessing to Jacob. Well, what happened? Esau felt like he'd been supplanted again, even though he had sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. And he thought his father was near death, and he planned to kill him as soon as, kill his brother, Jacob, as soon as the days of mourning were over. So Rebecca says, go to my, uh, my, your uncle Laban's house and stay there for a few days. A few days ended up to be 20 years. <laughs> But I did some research in the Bible. This is going to fascinate you. Did you know that he, Jacob, was close to 77 years old? Right. He was beyond middle-aged because he lived another 70 years. But he was 77 years old when he fled for Laban's house. Now, he was weary because he's running from he believes his brother's going to kill him. He stops for the night. He wasn't looking for God, but God was looking for him. Amen. And God appeared to him in a divine dream. And there was a ladder with angels that went from earth to heaven, heaven to earth. And there were angels going up and down. And God stood at the top of the ladder. And he said, I am the Lord your God, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. And in Genesis 28, 18 through 22, 
What we see is Jacob has had a spiritual wake-up call. He has had, he has seen the Lord in the form of the vision. He recognizes God as his provider. And he is ready to submit and commit to the Lord. And he promises right there in Genesis 28 that he is going to return a tenth of all that he receives to the Lord. And you know what happened? God became known not just as the God of Abraham and Isaac, but the God of Jacob as well. So it shows us that even when we're older, maybe we haven't always uh, made the right choice for Jesus, but it's never too late to wake up mm. and to enter into, I, I say it's never too late, as long as you've got a breath, you've got time, but we never know. None of us are promised tomorrow. So Jacob made some important life choices, both spiritual and financial. And uh, as part of his vow, he says in Genesis 28, 21, the Lord shall be my God. Now, it's interesting because our, the author of our adult Bible study guide says, what is important about the timing of this event? After Jacob made his spiritual commitment and his financial commitment to God, you know what happened? He arrives at Uncle Laban's house and he sees Rebecca at the well and he falls in love. And let me read directly from what the quarterly says. It is fitting to make your spiritual decision and your life work decision before commitment to marriage. Your future spouse should know what they're getting into. Hey, if you're getting ready to get married, know what you're getting into. Is this person a committed Christian? What type of work will they be involved in? What kind of life are you committing to? And then he says other questions that need answers before marriage uh, are what level of education have they completed? What amount of debt will come into the marriage? And am I willing to accept this situation as part of my responsibility? I want to tell you, the second most important decision you ever make, the first being accepting Christ as your Savior, the second most important decision is who you marry. Mm -hmm. So enter into that commitment very prayerfully. Mm, amen. Thank you so much, Shelley, for that great foundation and introduction. My name is Ryan Day, and I have Monday's lesson entitled The Blessing of Work. And I found it interesting because in parentheses, uh, Brother Reed put, ideally. <laughs> That's the idea, right? The idea is that work is for sure a blessing if we will allow it to be. Um, I'm going to actually, the way I approach this lesson, even though there were some incredible things brought out, as I begin to really develop uh, this lesson and really study it through, um, you know, I basically broke it up into a list. Oh. I, have, I have eight <laughs> truths about work. Uh, we know that it is a blessing. We're going to see that the Bible brings out many different ways. Of course, it's not limited to just these eight, uh, but uh, just to share a few of these things with you as we go through. Um, work, number one, work is meant to be a blessing even before sin. Did you know that? Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, in that perfect world that God had created for Adam and Eve and placing them into that garden of paradise. He told them, it says here in verse 15 of Genesis 2, then the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So it was meant to be a blessing even before sin. A lot of people think work is, is the result of sin. No, God meant for it to be a blessing before that. Even in Our High Calling, page 223, the lesson brings out this in quoting Our High Calling, page 223. It says, And to Adam was given the work of caring for the garden. The Creator knew that Adam could not be happy without employment. Yeah. The beauty of the garden delighted him, but this was not enough. He must have labor to call and to exercise the wonderful organs of the body. Had happiness consisted in doing nothing, man in his state of of, of holy innocence would have been left unemployed. But he who created man knew that wh uh, what would be for his happiness and no sooner had he created him than he had given him an appointed work. Uh, the promise of future glory and the decree that man must toil for his daily bread came from the same 
throne. So again, even before sin, work was meant to be a blessing. Uh, number two, point number two, uh, work teaches us to give our best and be disciplined to do things the right way. Right. Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse 10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. You know, this, this, this scripture as well as many others teach us that God not, we, oh, not only wants us to be blessed with the idea and the very reality of work, but that it teaches us. It helps to discipline us in, uh, in doing things the right way. There's nothing more irritating than having to work with someone who does something, uh, you know, half-heartedly or give them a job and they do it halfway. Uh, when my dad sent me out as a young man to start mowing the lawn at nine years old, I started at nine years old and I remember he wasn't about to have a half mowed lawn. He said, you're going to go out there and do it the right way. You're going to weed eat and you're going to pull the weeds. And, you're gonna, and he taught us how to do all of that. And so no stranger to, to hard work and good, good labor. Point number three, it's God's plan for us to work for our resources and needs. And so the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, it says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be burdened to uh, be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. I mean, we live, we live in a world today where people, you know, this, this modern culture in this modern time where people have the idea that, you know what, just, just to receive free handouts. And I'm not saying that's everyone, but there's certainly a mentality out there that they're entitled to just receive things. I saw an episode and I wouldn't watch the whole episode, but I saw a clip that somebody had shared on social media recently of a young girl who appeared on Dr. Phil's show and her mother had just showered her with credit cards and she had maxed them all out and she just wants to go shopping and she wants free handouts. But but then the mother, Dr. Phil encouraged and brought the mother to make the decision to, you know what, make your, your 16, 17 year old daughter go out and get a job. And the girl just wept and cried because she had now had to work <laughs> to actually go out and earn something for herself. And it was just sad to watch the state of this young, young girl's mind. Ephesians chapter four, verse 28, it says, let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Point number four, work teaches us a sense of accomplishment and helps establish healthy goals and a healthy mindset. Uh, oh, I love this text. Every time I read it, I, it just, <laughs> just let me read it. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 11. I'm going to read New King James Version. It says, he who tills the land will be satisfied with bread, but he who follows frivolity is devoid of understanding. Mm. But then I read NIV and it says, same, same text, uh, uh, Proverbs 12, 11. Those who work with, with their land will have abundant food, but those those who, who, ch who chase fantasies have no sense. I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, if you chase fantasies, you have no sense. How many people have some sense here today? Let's, let's act like we have some sense. The Lord has given us some clear, clear uh, counsel on this issue. Proverbs 12, 24 even says, The hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. All of these principles are made clear in the Word of God. Point number five, work helps to prevent poverty. Proverbs 14, verse 23, In all labor there is poverty profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Now we know not always, we understand poverty sometimes comes in the form of misfortunes and other things, but for the, for the, for the sake of this particular lesson, uh, yes, talking about work, if you choose not to work, it could lead to poverty. Proverbs 6 verses 10 and 11, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. And so again, God wants us to work. It's his plan yeah. that we are to labor for those things and, and, and to bring about a healthy situation in our life. Point number six, work helps us stay out of trouble. <laughs> now, when I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I thought of this one, immediately there was a story that came to my mind. I'm going to read it and we're going to talk about it just for a moment. Second Samuel 11 verses one and two. We know this chapter to say it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. And you know the rest of that story. David stayed home from work. He didn't go to work when he should have been at work. 
and should have been uh, attending to what it sh he should have been doing as the leader of Israel, setting the example. He stayed home from work and it got him in trouble. So be careful not to stay home from work when you ought to be at work uh, doing those things that the, that the Lord even counsels us that we should be doing. Point number seven, we have a responsibility to work and provide for those who cannot provide for themselves. This is a big one. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Notice what the Bible says. It says, But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, yeah. he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever, my friends. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a strong one. And, and we live, unfortunately, we live in a society where it is the case that, uh, that many men and women are neglecting the needs of those within their control. Maybe it's their children, maybe it's their family, their wife, their mother, their father who cannot provide for themselves. I mean, we even live in a culture, and I'm certainly not uh, kicking this down because I recognize in certain situations, uh, you know, you cannot uh, avoid certain cases in which, you know, family members need to go in special care homes or, or whatnot. But, you know, we certainly live in a society, and even this was condemned in Scripture, that people just forget about their love and say, ah, I'm just going to live for me. I'm going to do my thing. Mom and daddy, get out of my life. And, and it, it, it's just a sad thing that that is a reality in the world that we live in where people live more for themselves than to live up to the responsibility that God has called them to do. And that is that a work is not just a blessing. It's a blessing not just for you and for your personal gain, but also for the, uh, for the sustaining of others and the helping of others, especially those within your control and within your home, your household and, and your family. Uh, so remember that, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse Verse eight. And of course, the last one here I had to add uh, just came to my mind. I, I'm excited about it. You know, a lot of times we think, well, when you know, I've heard people say, oh, man, I'm tired of working. I'm tired of labor, but ready for Jesus to come back and deliver me from all this hard, hard, hard labor of this life. Well, you know what? Work is still a blessing even in the new earth to come. Mm -hmm. Because in Isaiah chapter 65, <laughs> verses 21 to 23, it says they shall build. This is in the new earth, right? This is when we have a city home and the Bible says we're going to have country homes. We're going to work on these properties. We're going we're gonna to build them. We're going to care for them. And it's going to be a blessing. Isaiah 65 verses 21 to 23. They shall build houses and inherit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and, and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of the tree, so shall be the days of my people and my elect. Notice, and my elect shall, shall long enjoy the work of of their hands and they shall not labor in vain. When we, when we get to the new heaven and new earth, we'll never get tired. We'll, we'll, we'll look at work as a blessing. Not a single soul going to complain about labor or work when they get to the new earth. It's going to be a blessing. We're going to be able to coexist together. We're going to have a country home, a beautiful property, a new beautiful home and, and a vineyard that we're going to tend and work each and every day with a smile on our face. And so work is for sure, ideally, a blessing according to scripture. Amen. 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 And I just want to say, parents, your responsibility is to teach your children to have a love relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. But the second most important thing is to instill a good work ethic in mm -hmm. your child. And if you're getting ready to get married, it's more important to me they've got a good work ethic <laughs> than a master's degree. Okay, we're going to show you how you can share a link and save a life for eternity. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. And now we continue with Tuesday's lesson and Pastor John Denzi. Thank you. The blessing of Tuesday's lesson is uh, the title, The Earning Years. And this takes us into what the family, what their responsibility is, family unity, and the importance of work as well. And according to the lessons, uh, we are supposed to uh, understand, to teach the children that work is important. And it says here that the average individual works about 40 years. And it says during the earning years, this can be a very intense time financially. It is very sensitive time because the family is learning to work together. 
and its members are creating lifelong bonds. Financial stress can wreck the marriage at this point and frequently does. And this is true. You know, you look at the statistics and um, one of the uh, top reasons why there is divorce is because of financial difficulties. Mm -hmm. So it is important to learn to handle finances. And that's why this, uh, this whole uh, quarterly is important for uh, the Christian families. And really, uh, it is uh, important for us to learn how to handle money. We talked about putting the credit cards in the freezer and uh, not getting them out. <laughs> and, and so let's go right to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Notice this scripture. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And the King James Version says it, an infidel. So we see that uh, the Bible really brings the importance of work to a very high level. So uh, we have to also understand that there are individuals, there are families that have uh, some difficulty. Maybe there's a family member that has a, uh, um, let us say, a lifelong illness. And so the family has to adjust. Uh, at some time, it could be that the father, which normally is the what they call the breadwinner of the household, a disease comes or uh, has a heart attack or a stroke, and now the family has to adjust. Perhaps the wife that did not work now has to work, and it creates a difficulty in the family. So we understand that there are some individuals that cannot work, but those that can work and refuse to work, this is why you have this scripture. If you don't provide for your own, especially for those of your household, mm. you have denied the faith. So according to this, it is part of the Christian faith to be a worker to provide for yourself and your family. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23, we have the following words. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Mm. Uh, a very important point to understand. In order for us to have the... Uh, things we need in our homes, the food on our table, electricity, water, and the things that are necessary for life, somebody has to work. Right. I have met some people that uh, uh, there are some societies like the United States that because uh, somebody has some type of uh, incapacity, they have something called welfare. But there are people that try to find loopholes and they say, oh man, I, I, can, I can live without work. I just have to claim that I have some kind of incapacity. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, unfortunately, there are those type of people. So the Bible says uh, what we have just read. Uh, you deny the faith if you refuse to work when you can. Colossians chapter 3 verse 23 tells us how we should work. And uh, I'll also read verse 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily. How? As to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Wherever you work, whatever your job is, uh, we should consider that we're working for the Lord. Not only that, we are representing Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. especially if you work in a place where it's not a Christian uh, company, it's not a Christian uh, uh, environment. You are representing the Lord and... Uh, people should look upon you as somebody that is uh, dedicated, somebody that does, it's not a slacker. <laughs> sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes the word slacker is used. And Christians should be the best example and have the best reputation of doing a job well. Not somebody that is looked upon as, uh, okay, he's, gonna, uh, he's not going to do the job right. He's going to uh, take his time and also not uh, somebody that you can count on. Uh, here in the lesson we have uh, this uh, thought that I'd like to read to you. It says, the children who are brought into the world during this segment of life, that's the earning years, are called a heritage from the Lord, Psalm 127, verse 3. We must remember that children bring with them an awesome responsibility. Mm -hmm. And while we have to work, we have to balance these things because uh, society, you know you have that thing that's still around, keeping up with the Joneses. Oh, they have a car, we better get a car because the Joneses have a car. And whatever they get, we have to get. We have to be careful with those things and uh, use money wisely. And I want to bring some points out that are brought out in the lesson, which are very important. I, they, they did a good job. Uh, 
keeping this in mind, and in the last part of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 13, because we're talking about bringing up children as well. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Mm -hmm. So if God has given you children, you have the awesome responsibility, the great responsibility to show them the way of the Lord. That's right. To, sh to let them know that there is a God in heaven. He created us and there's a plan of salvation. It's a great responsibility. And we have to set an example. If children see us um, just being lazy when there are things to do in the home uh, that are necessary, but the the uh, thing they see from day to day, de week to week is that, okay, uh, honey, when are you going to take the garbage out? <laughs> because according to most families, uh, the husband is supposed to take the garbage out. When are you going to take the garbage out? And you see this thing kind of uh, taking place. The children learn that they are sponges. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've learned a lot from our children, Samuel and Caleb. It's very interesting. And one of these things uh, that we're going to share is as we go along, uh, here it says in number one, there are three points brought out in the lesson. Provide a Christian home environment. This would include regular and interesting family worship, regular Sabbath school and church attendance, and faithfulness in tithes and offerings. Children need to learn to see you faithful in tithes and offerings. Uh, it's not that you just prepare it and drop it in the envelope because kids are watching you and they want to drop it in the envelope. Tell them why you are preparing your tithe envelope, why you are preparing offering. And let them know that they too, from what they receive, because children receive gifts, uh, they too can set aside offerings. And of their increase, uh, we taught our children that when, whenever they receive something, they should save a tithe to give it, to, to return it to the Lord. And this is an interesting quote from Adventist Home, page 32, the greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. This will recommend the truth as nothing else can, for it is a living witness mm -hmm. of its practical power upon the heart. So provide a Christian environment for the home. This is something that children need and teach them. As it says in Proverbs 9, 10, 11, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me, thy days shall be multiplied and the years of thy life shall be increased. Let's go to point number two. Teach them a willingness to work and an appreciation for it. Children will discover that diligence and integrity at work are always noticed, appreciated, and rewarded. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting teaching our children to work. You know, we, uh, uh, one of the things I would tell the kids, uh, it's good to work, <laughs> but it's better to work smart. So, we, you know, if you're doing a job around, if there's a better way to do it, try. Uh, it's not, don't just be a robot. Try to figure out a better way to do it. That's right. I also told them, uh, because sometimes, you know, uh, do this, and I found them, they started playing <laughs> and say, hey, wait a minute. Um, do what you're supposed to do, and when you're done, you can do what you'd like to do. And so these are very simple things to bring to children's attention so that they can understand there's a time to work, there's also a time that you can play. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 6, uh, verse 6 and onward, it says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which have no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber or sluggard? Then when will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and you your need like an armed man. So uh, the Bible stresses the importance of work. And of course, uh, it says here, uh, number three, help with a good education. Children need to be educated. They need to understand that they have to study to learn some type of career that will be of a benefit to them, a blessing to them, and to their families if they choose to have families. So time is gone, and so uh, consider these things. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Johnny. Um, we know Samuel and Caleb well, and you and Adalia did a great job with your sons. Yes. Um, Jill Morricone, I have Wednesday's lesson, Working with Integrity. Now, I've renamed it Living a Life of Integrity, because, you know, integrity counts in your workplace, absolutely. 
but it also matters in your home. Right. Integrity matters at the school. Integrity matters in the church and in the community. So first we'll just look at what is integrity and then we have five biblical keys to living a life of integrity. But what is integrity? The dictionary says it's the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Another site says integrity implies trustworthiness and incorruptibility to a degree that one is incapable of being false to a trust, responsibility, or pledge. This is Jill's definition of integrity. A uh, person with integrity is a person who's honest. They always tell the truth, incapable of being deceptive or dishonest. A person of integrity is a person who is trustworthy. They're reliable. They accomplish what they say they will do. They meet you at the time they say they will, or they let you know if they can't make it at that time. I remember we had an employee, this was several years ago, that uh, she possessed reliability and trustworthiness. She possessed integrity. If she would take a paper clip by accident from 3ABN and she would get home and discover that the paper clip was at home, you know what she did? She got in her car. She drove back to 3ABN and she would return the paper clip after hours. Now, if it was me, sometimes I bring a pen home by accident. I'll just say, I'll bring it in the morning. You know, I'll return it in the morning. But she would get in her car that night. That is a person who's trustworthy. A person who's trustworthy keeps your information in confidence, does not spill secrets. A person who's loyal, has your back, does not discuss you with others, never cheats. Mm. A person with integrity is a person with morality. They take the highest road. They don't lie. They don't cheat. True to the word. They avoid even the appearance of fraud, deception, or immorality. A person of integrity is a person who is accountable to God and to other people, who accepts responsibility for their own actions and does not, Shelley, as Molly used to say, blame, shift, and justify their actions. A person with integrity is a person who's ethical, who chooses to do the right thing, regardless of the consequences. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that list, wow, that's a high list. How are we even supposed to live lives of integrity? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We can think, oh yes, I live in integrity. And then the next moment you realize, I didn't even know what was in my heart. So how do we live lives of integrity as men and women of God? Here's five keys to help you on that journey. Number one, choose God and his law. We're going to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. Choose God and his law. This key is foundational to developing a life of integrity. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. You cannot be a person of integrity without God. You know, Pastor John, people say, oh, I'm a good person. I can live a moral life. I can live an upstanding life. The truth is you cannot be a person of integrity without God. Yeah, the principles okay. of integrity are Sorry. biblical principles. So the first key, if you want to live a life of integrity, is just choose God. Mm -hmm. Say, God, I'm choosing to give you my life. And will you write your law in my heart? Key number two, you have to make a choice to walk in in integrity. Proverbs 22 verse 1, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. You have to make a choice. I want to walk in integrity, loving favor rather than silver or gold. You know, integrity, it doesn't just happen by accident. You just don't roll out of bed and say, oh yeah, I'm a person of integrity. It is a choice to take the high road mm -hmm. and to take the difficult road sometimes. There's a quote I like, this has to do with integrity in business. Integrity alone will not make you a great business leader, but if you act without integrity, you will eventually erode your opportunity to influence other people. There's three forms of integrity I would submit to you. We have internal integrity. That's doing the right thing even when nobody else is looking. I'm going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. We also have 
external integrity. That's doing what you promise to other people. This is external integrity. But we also have, and we don't often consider this, the image of integrity. What does that mean? How do you even protect the image of integrity? Here's an example. Say you have a business corporate card and you charge something personal on that card and then you say, it won't matter, I can repay it later. And you repay it later. There's nothing morally wrong with that because it's paid, nothing ethically wrong with it. But if someone sees you make that charge, this is the image of integrity. If someone knows and doesn't know that it was actually paid back, that that could be a tarnish on that image of integrity. If you say you'll do something, to do it. Live a life in private that possesses just as much integrity mm -hmm. as the life in public. Key number three to living a life of integrity. Choose biblical principles and God's law over your personal feelings and preference. You know, so many times I'm a feeling based person and so that's how I tend to operate, but that's not how God's word says it. We need to choose to operate by principle, not by how we feel at that moment. You know, I think about the story of Joseph, you know, Genesis 39. He was in Potiphar's house. He was a slave. And what does the Bible say in verse 6? Potiphar, we're in Genesis 39, 6. Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's hand. Why? Joseph was a person of integrity. He did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Potiphar? He trusted Joseph. And yet in verse 9, if you follow the story, you'll see that Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce Joseph. And how does he respond? He says, there is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see, we see that Joseph chose the approbation of God over the approval of men. Mm -hmm. Joseph right. chose principle over preference. He chose decision over desire. He chose faith over feeling. Integrity might not always be easy, but mm -hmm. it is always worth it when we make the choice to choose principle and the principles of God's word over how we feel or our personal preference. Mm -hmm. Key number four to living a life of integrity choose to live with eternity in view. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything should be filtered through the lens of God and what is pleasing to God. Not what I want to do, not what I feel like doing, but what is pleasing to God. We should make decisions in light of eternity. Integrity, it focuses on the end goal, not the here and now. We could say, Pastor John, integrity practices delayed gratification in some of those things. Finally, key number five, last key, choose to trust everything with God. A person of integrity will trust the results with God. It's not our job to try to gain favor. It's not our job to try to get a promotion or any of that. We leave the results with God. We trust him. We choose to praise and exalt his name. Proverbs 21 verse one. I love this verse because it says that truly we can trust God with everything. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, mm -hmm. like the rivers of water, and he turns it wherever he wishes. What does that tell us? Mm -hmm. That says that God's in charge of everything. Right. We think we have to worry about stuff. We think we have to be concerned. No, God sees the government. God sees the kings and rulers. God sees the church. God sees organizations. We can trust all that with him. So I just want to challenge you, if right now you're not living a life of integrity, you can make a choice, mm -hmm. a choice for God and his word. You can seek to practice the principles of integrity and watch as God can change your life for the better. Wow. Thank you, Jill. Wonderful, wonderful. Praise the Lord. Wonderfully said and wonderfully communicated, which leads in a beautiful way right into seeking godly counsel. 
that's the foundation from which integrity can continue. You know, the writer, and I appreciate the approach to the lesson, as I mentioned, knowing him personally, knows that this is a man whose heart has been consumed in understanding finances in the context of godly application and godly living. This talks about seeking godly counsel. And he points out that there are many money management companies today, many money, money management gurus, many get rich quick schemes, and people are anxious to counsel you as to how to handle your money. You know, you see people say, and they may have good intentions, I could help your money grow, I could, I could invest it aggressively, but be willing to take the risk. One person once says, don't be willing to invest more than you are willing to lose. When it comes to handling God money, God doesn't want you to put your life at risk. God doesn't want you to put your hard-earned monies, your hard-earned possessions in the hand of someone who's promising you something that he cannot predict or she cannot predict and cannot honestly deliver. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs 24 and verse 6. For by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is what? Safety. There is safety. Bounce it off of people of experience, and I say that people of experience in finances, like people like uh, G. Edward Reed, uh, appreciate him so much. People that have been there have seen the money markets go up. Sometimes even those of us who have retirements, the market may shift or there may be an earthquake in the financial world. Don't get nervous and you know, damage your entire future by pulling your money out. Or Those are plans that you have to make with counsel, people that understand how things operate. And so when we think about that, you almost always have to include God in those decisions. And so don't put your money in the hand of a secular-minded person who doesn't use godly principles. Psalms 1 verse 1 to 3 makes this point very clear. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. That means people that don't have any godly commitment. They said, I can make your money grow. Who's God? Don't put your hand, don't put your money in that person's hand nor stand in the path of sinners. Sometimes we like to meander in the maze of mediocrity, be around people that are financially savvy, people that have a lot of money. But what's their relationship to God is more important than how much they possess because many people that possess much are possessed by much, mm -hmm. nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But watch this. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. People that have a, an accountability factor, I like the way you said that, Jill, and that accountability factor is not based on public but public and private life. They're not saying, how can I swindle this person <laughs> like the Bernie Madoffs? And the individual that is somebody that was recently arrested had, you know, this Ponzi scheme and, and this, you know, the digital currency and all these things that are just, for the most part, a get rich quick yeah. movement. And people say, I promise you, I could make your money grow exponentially. No. You are standing in the you're standing in the path of sinners, and you may be sitting in the seat of the scornful. Yeah. But if they delight in God's law, and watch this, they meditate on that principle day and night. What will happen to you? You shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bring forth its fruit in its season. Your investments will come to pass when you follow godly principles, whose leaf also shall not wither wither and whatever he does shall prosper, but you must delight in the Lord. How do you delight in the Lord? Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord your God with all your heart, and whether you can't see the future or you can, lean not on your own understanding. When you write your checks, when you pay your bills, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he promises to direct our paths. So, Jill, what I loved about my day is I like to put points together, but he put them together for me. <laughs> so let's go through the seven points of how you can apply godly principles to have, uh, to have a life of integrity and financial feasibility. First one, get organized. See it with me? Get organized. Get organized. Devise a plan. Proverbs 27, verse 23 to 24. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. That means understand your bank balance. Understand how you're spending money. Look at that in reality. Some people are afraid to look at money, but it tells a story about their heart. He says in verse 24, For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. You might be at the top today, but at the bottom tomorrow. You might be basking in that corner office overlooking the ocean, but one false move, you're in the basement sweeping the floors. Be careful not to glory in the pos position you're in, 
but to use principles guided by godly counsel. The other one, number two, spend less than you earn. Determine to live within your means. Don't covet other people's possessions or don't even covet your own possessions saying, I need more. Proverbs 15, verse 16, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Wow, isn't that nice? You know, if you could have a heart at peace at night and not worry about, I heard a siren, are they coming to arrest me? No, be able to walk down the street and not fear going to jail or going to the store and be honest when you purchase something that you're not using someone else's credit card without their permission. And believe me, that happens today. That's why my wife and I, when we throw out things like bills or credit card offers, we shred it. Mm. Because people take that, I lost my identity once and it took me six months to get it back to prove I am who I am. So I speak from experience. Many people in the Western world, they live above their means. They spend more than they earn and they make it impossible to live a life where children can look forward with a, a great heart of, my mom and dad are taking care of me. My mom and dad are making wise plans, which brings me to the third point. Save a portion from every paycheck. John Dinsey used this passage, Proverbs 6, verse 6 to 8. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food at the harvest. Mm -hmm. So look at the ants. I mean, really, you can try to get rid of ants, but there's so many of them because you know why you can't get rid of them? They have a plan. That's right. And that plan is way deeper than you think. They're, you know, those ants are working their hearts out because they know the cold weather is coming and I'm not going to be out there freezing. While you're trying to get rid of them, they're planning for the seasons ahead. What does that say to us? Plan for the seasons where all the circumstances may not be in your favor. But if you look down the road, I always say you got to perspire, perspire now and be at ease later. Number four, I love the way he said this, avoid debt like COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, Elder Reed. <laughs> Proverbs 22, verse 7. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. You know, some people have just come out of the holiday season, out of the season of spending, and they're sitting there. The gifts no longer look as, as appealing as they did in the beginning because the, the bills are coming in now and they're cutting on all the edges. What do I pay? What do I not pay? Do, did I really need that television? Because it's like $25 more than I can afford per month. Watch out. The slave that you have made yourself is not one that you can easily extricate yourself from. Watch out. And even interest payments, those things may look good. Hey, zero interest for six months. After that, 31% interest. Don't go for it. Be a diligent worker, which brings me to point number five. Be a diligent worker. Proverbs 13, verse 4. Proverbs is a powerful book. Yes. If you want to be wise, get some of these Proverbs in your heart so they can guide your life. Proverbs 13, verse 4, the soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a lot of money, but that means you are going to be financially soluble. You're going to be able to cover your needs. And there's another passage the lazy man says, there's a lion in the streets. Um, if I go out, he's going to devour me. There's some people that won't find a job because they want the job to come to them. I asked a young man once, I said, are you looking for a job every day? Have you left the house yet? Nah, what are you doing? Playing video games. But I put some applications in online. That's laziness. Mm -hmm. Don't be a lazy person. Money, you know, even if somebody mailed a check to you, you got to go to the post office to get it. You got to walk across the floor to the mailbox to get it. Don't be lazy. Be careful. Be a diligent worker. And let me tell you something. Nobody ever died from being a diligent and honest worker. Number six, be financially faithful to God. Deuteronomy 28, verse 10. It's a very long one, all the way down to verse 14. But it points out very carefully, then all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Why? Because God is prospering you. God is blessing you. And when you follow those principles, it's not that their fear of you is because you're going to hurt them, but they say, wait a minute, don't touch that individual. That person is under God's guidance and God's blessings. When you are faithful to God, God will be more than faithful to you. And point number seven, remember that this earth is not our real home. Mm -hmm. Matthew 25, 21 his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. 
Yes, seek godly counsel and God will bless you. Amen. Uh, thank Lord. you, each and every one of you. I just so appreciate the opportunity to sit and learn from what you all have studied. We have a few moments for closing thoughts. Amen. We learned on Monday's lesson that work is a blessing in Ecclesiastes 9.10, which we read. Let me read it again. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work nor device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Amen. Thank you so much. And for those uh, family members, those uh, parents, I would like to encourage you to let your light so shine before men and your children and your family that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Thank you. I had Wednesday, which is living a life of integrity. And if you've not lived a life of integrity, maybe you've been dishonest or not always told the truth, and maybe you're not even sure if there's any hope for you, I want to tell you there is hope for you. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. From today, you can begin that life of integrity. That's right. In Proverbs 24, verse 6, in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Here's the point. When your mind is guided by God, your life will not be deceived by man. Trust the safety of a multitude of counselors. Mm -hmm. Amen and amen. Thank you, Ryan, John Dinsey, Jill, John Lomacain. Thank you so much for your input. And we're so grateful that you've watched. Remember, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. We want you to plan for success. And it begins with your priorities. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all this will be added unto you. Seek to do God, to do God's will, to do it his way. He wants you to be successful. Now, we are so glad that you were with us this week, but be sure and join us next week for lesson number nine, Beware of Covetousness. Our prayer for you is that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you today and always.